So, one more for me, David Joe. Hello, hello. I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are welcome to True Transformations. It's a very wonderful night. It's a wonderful night indeed. We give God all the praises. Father, we exalt you. We exalt you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you Lord. We say, let your name alone be praised in the name of Jesus. You are welcome, brethren. I want you to stick around us, wait for the next few minutes. We're starting the meeting in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the living Lord. Blessed be the name of the living Lord. Father, we exalt you. Father, we exalt you. We give you all the praises, O Lord, for you alone deserve it. O Lord, we say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, O Lord. 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 Father, we say, blessed be your holy name, Jesus. Blessed be your holy name, Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. We worship you, O Lord. We believe you are here, Lord. We believe you are here, Lord. Father, let your name be praised, O Lord. Let your name be praised, O Lord. Let your name alone be praised, O Lord. We thank you for this wonderful moment. Father, we worship you, Lord. Father, we worship you, Lord. We say you are highly praised, O Lord. You are highly praised, O Lord. You are highly praised, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory be to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We say, blessed be your holy name, O Lord. We say, blessed be your holy name, O Lord. Father, we exalt you, O Lord. Father, we exalt you, O Lord. We say, you are worthy. We say, you are worthy. We say, you are worthy. You deserve all the praises, O Lord. You deserve all the glory. You deserve every honor, every adoration be unto your holy name, Jesus. Father, we say thank you, Jesus. Glory, 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 glory be unto your name, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. 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 Father, we say you are worthy, O Lord. We say you are worthy, O Lord. Be thou exalted, O Lord. Be thou exalted, O Lord. Father, we exalt you, Lord. Father, we exalt you, Lord. Father, we praise your name, O Lord. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let your name alone be praised this evening, O Lord. Anywhere you are connected, you are welcome in the name of the Lord. This is True Transformations. Anywhere you are connected on Facebook, on YouTube, anywhere you are, and those trying to connect on Zoom, we, you are welcome. You are welcome. We are welcoming you in the name of the Lord. Amen. 
with me in this wonderful evening is somebody I, I will call a father, a mentor, and one of my Hebrew professors at the School of Urban Missions, Dorado Hills, SUM. I have Dr. Richard Cook in the house this evening. Hallelujah. Is it not awesome? God is awesome. All the way from the United States of America, we're connecting here from Ghana Live. And I have people connected from all around the world on Facebook. They are watching live on Facebook. And we have people connected on Zoom. And we have people that will be joining us later, uh, watch it later on YouTube by the special grace of God. This video will be uploaded on YouTube this time tomorrow evening. The video will be premiered this time tomorrow in the name of Jesus. We are here this evening. We are here to learn. We are here to learn. We are here to learn. Daddy, I would like you to please speak further. I want you to please introduce yourself to our viewers at home. Amen. Okay. It's good to be with you. And uh, am I, well, for I, for I, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I've been, uh, uh, as, as it was said, I, I'm in the United States. Uh, state of Tennessee is where I'm at right now. And um, I, uh, I've been married to my wife for 53 years and uh, been in ministry uh, 51 years. Uh, most of that pastoral ministry have uh, 12 grandchildren and two great grandchildren and uh, life is great. And um, uh, back in, uh, I'll just share this with everybody right quickly, back in about 99, 1999, the Lord spoke to me one day, and of course, I'd been in ministry for 30-some years at the time, he spoke to me, and he said, if, if you live and die, and you fail to put in print what I taught you, and you fail to mentor the next generation, you will have failed in ministry, so at that time, I knew my life was going to change, I went back to school to get uh, my Master of Divinity and my Doctor of Ministry, realizing that in order to reach a larger audience, I had to have academic credentials uh, in the world in which we live. And so um, uh, my, my life is dedicated right now to mentoring people for ministry. And uh, that's what I did my doctoral project on. Um, and also uh, now I'm at the point where I need to start putting things into print and, and writing and and, and developing materials that can help the next generation. So that's just a little bit about me. So. Hallelujah. We bless God. So you actually went back to the school so you could learn how to pour into their younger generations. Yes. Wow. Definitely. Awesome. Awesome. You are, well, we're so blessed to have you in this place this evening. And like I said earlier on, we are here to learn about the Five food ministry. You know, there's so much conviction in the body of Christ today. There's a lot of conviction. And I feel like we, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn because so many things are going on. And if we want, truly want to learn and if we are ready to learn, then we should learn from the older generation. I believe you have a lot to pass over to the next generation to come. And as we are rising, not just we ministers, I believe every believer have a lot to learn about the five food ministry. You know, a lot of questions have come in. We actually sent the message across during the promotion that people should send in their questions. And a lot of questions, part of the questions that came was that today everyone is being referred to as pastors, pastors, pastors. So even prophets are being called pastors. Evangelists are being referred to as pastors. Christians just believe everybody in that position of authority at the church is to be revered automatically as a pastor. Well, well, what do you what do you think about this? I don't know whether that's the right place we have to start from, or maybe we should start by divining the five-fold ministry itself. So. Okay, let me uh, let me ask a couple questions. Number one, um, we have an hour, right? Is, is 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 we're going for an hour today, correct? Yeah, we are going for an hour, but we are okay. not time bound. We are spirit bound. Yeah. It depends yeah. on you yourself. It depends <laughs> on your availability. Okay. Yeah. Let's let, let me begin by reading the uh, foundational scripture for fivefold ministry, and then I'll go to that question because it definitely is one that needs to be answered. Uh, and may I say, for those listening either on Zoom or on um, uh, Facebook. Uh, 
if you have questions, please bring them up, okay? And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, they would be bringing them up to you and then you can share them with me. So, uh, because I, I think that we learn the best by questions, by, you know, uh, where we're at. But let me start by reading the foundational scripture and you find it in Ephesians 4. And, uh, and I'm gonna begin reading in verse seven, even though it's, uh, most people begin at verse 11, I think it's important to start at verse seven where it says, but Paul said, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that's important, that he gave gifts to men. Verse nine, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he first also descended, first into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also he that ascended far above all things, that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, let me stop right there and say that connects to verse number eight. He gave gifts to men. And he's finishing his, his discussion here by saying these are the gifts that he has given to the body of Christ, to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So the difference, let me stop right here and say, and I have a hard time, there's so much to say, okay, there's so much to say. Let me stop right here and say that, let me, let me try to explain it this way. One of the gifts that he gives to the church is prophets, okay? A lot of people prophesy through the simple gift of prophecy or the supernatural gift of prophecy recorded in 1 Corinthians 12. But just because a person operates in the gift of prophecy does not make them a prophet. What happens is, let me try to explain it this way. When someone operates in the supernatural gift of prophecy, according to 1 Corinthians 12, that gift of prophecy is the gift. But here in Ephesians 4, 9 and 10 and 11, the prophet is the gift. The gift changes. It changes from just being a function to being in a person. And the reason that's important is because I heard this many years ago and it resonated with me. When God gives a gift, he always wraps it in a person. And so the gifts that God is talking about here is not necessarily just the function. The gift is the person, the gift of an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. I, I used to tell my congregation, whether you like it or not, I am God's gift to you, okay? And, and we need to realize that. So, so he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What for? For the equipping of the saints. For the service, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. How long? Verse 13. Until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, into a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness with the defeat, deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ himself, from whom the whole body is joined together and connected by every joint and ligament, as every part effectively does the work, its work and grows, building itself up in love. So that's our foundational scripture. And what I want you to, to understand here is the reason I inserted some words was not that I was adding to scripture. It was that I was trying to explain what this is saying. Why did God give these gifts? To build up the body and, and prepare the body. For how long? Until we're mature. And I think that answers the question, are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers still valid for today? Yes, because the church is not mature. And it says, God gave those gifts until we become mature. When are we going to become mature? When he comes back for us. Okay. So I just wanted to share that to alleviate, alleviate, uh, get rid of this idea that these things have passed away. 
Now, this is on Facebook Live. This is going to be on, on, on uh, uh, YouTube. So it depends upon where you are listening to this as to, as to how your particular part of the world views apostles and prophets. In America, apostles and prophets are not widely accepted. And one reason they're not widely accepted is because, I think one reason is because sometimes apostles and prophets have not acted in the maturity of Christ. And they've tried to push themselves and it's caused pastors to say, hey, we'd rather not deal with that. And so we're just going to say that these, these uh, apostles and prophets are no longer valid. But guys, it, it says until we become mature. So now let me transition into that original question, because there's so much that could be said. I, I think this is a good way to do it. Let me transition into that original question. Why does it seem like everybody's a pastor? They're not. You cannot function outside of the anointing that God's placed in you. So if you happen to be an apostle, just because you pastor a church does not make you a pastor. Although many apostles have apostolic function working through them. But let's, let's go to a different one. Uh, a prophet. Just because you're a prophet and you have the title of a pastor does not make you a pastor. Title is not as important as function. Now, the, everything I say brings up another question. So then is it wrong to call ourselves by the title? In other words, is it wrong to call somebody Apostle John and somebody Pastor Peter and, and, and somebody Evangelist uh, Julianne? No, it's not wrong. It's just that if you have to have one or the other, and I don't think you have to have one or the other, but if you have to have one or the other, you want function over title. Okay. Because all of these, let's take apostle for a minute, which some, uh, uh, some groups of Christianity do not uh, uh, believe in, the, in apostles today. But when you, when you discuss with them and you use a different term, and you might say something like, well, then, but do you believe in apostolic function? Some of those people, of course, are going to say no, but others will say, yeah, I believe in the function. I just don't believe in the office. And my view of that is, okay, then let's just function. Why, why disagree over whether it's, a, it's an office or not? That's not as important as the fact that that function is alive in the church. And so I think that if we have uh, disagreement in the body of Christ, what we need to do is focus on where we can agree rather than on where we disagree. Let me carry that one step further, and, and then I'll open it up for any more questions here. Let me carry that one step further. I think that the Lord has come in the back door to some churches and denominations that do not believe in the apostle. And the way he has come in the back door is in some of these denominations, while they may do not believe in apostles and they believe the day of the apostle is over, they are now beginning to realize that um, multi-site churches is an effective way to minister to the world and to the community, where one church has different sites, multi-sites, with pastors over those sites, and the pastor of the main congregation is over all of those pastors. What is that? Apostolic function. It's a, and so they're not calling them apostles. In fact, many of those people functioning apostolically would never call themselves an apostle, and yet the function is there, and I think that's all that's important, because as I said, when God gives a gift, he wraps it in a person, and the function is more important than the title. I did not say that it's wrong to call somebody an apostle. I just said that if you have to have one or the other, function is more important. So let's go to that question, and then I'll open it up again. 
why is it that everybody nowadays seems to be a pastor? It's because that's the only position that's paid. I mean, let's just let's just cut to the chase. Most churches do not have enough money to 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 uh, uh, to give to a, 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 an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. They only have resources to to have one person lead them. So where is the money going to go to their pastor? So what you see is that many times the person who's called the pastor may really not be a pastor. They're an evangelist. Or they really, maybe they really are not a pastor, but they're a prophet. But, but, but they, but they, uh, uh, but they have a family and, and they have to support that family and they want to be in ministry. So what are they going to do? They're going to become a pastor, but in reality, they're not a pastor. They have a pastoral title, but they have a apostolic or a prophetic or a, or a teaching gift or, or an evangelistic anointing. And that is, so someone says, well, then that's wrong. Not necessarily. It's only wrong if the person who has the title of pastor does not bring along on staff a pastor who can pastor the people. In other words, maybe the senior pastor is an evangelist. That's okay, as long as they realize they're really not a pastor, so they bring somebody on staff that can pastor the people, and they can focus on evangelism. I, I hope that makes sense, okay? And it probably brought a lot more questions, but I'll, I'll just uh, uh, let, uh, go, go ahead if there are other questions here. Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. You know, it, uh, according to you, it's not all about the title, but the function. So, and I think if we truly understand this, then, there will not be all these questions of what am I supposed to be doing as a minister or who am I as a minister? But if I may ask, how can one identify him or herself either as an apostle or, or a prophet or an evangelist? How do I know my office? How, how do you know your calling? Yeah, how do I know my calling? Okay. A very good question. And there's no one concrete answer for that. So let me give you a few of them. Uh, first of all, you know by just spending time with God. I mean, we all need to uh, press in to God, press into the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and with this question, what is my anointing? Where do I function? And so number one, of course, the answer to that question is we, we, we have to hear it from God. We have to know from God. But how do we hear from God? Can he speak out of heaven? Of course. Does he usually? No. Okay. So there, are, uh, there have to be other ways. Even if we're pressing into God for the answer as to what, how I'm anointed and what my calling is, he speaks to us usually through other venues. And here's, another, here's a second way. How does he speak to us? Sometimes he speaks to us through our personalities. I believe that God uh, uh, developed us with a certain personality that works well with the gift that he wants us to operate in. A third way would be that we recognize what our calling is by where we feel comfortable. What do we feel comfortable doing? In other words, if you, if you do not feel comfortable um, uh, uh, caring for and dealing with the issues and problems of the congregation, you're probably not a pastor. Okay. Um, if you don't feel comfortable standing up and preaching the word, you're probably not a teacher or a pastor. Um, uh, so in other words, I think that, and let me say it in the opposite direction what you feel comfortable with and what becomes easy for you is an indication that that's where your anointing is. A fourth way that I think we can determine how we're called and anointed, and listen carefully to this because I think this is very important. Listen to the input of other people. Your peer, your mentors, your pastors, 
your peers, those under you, because oftentimes they see something in you before you see it. In other words, maybe God has gifted you pastorally, but you don't consider yourself to be a pastor. You don't think of yourself as a pastor, but people are coming to you for pastoral covering and pastoral ministry. And, 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 and all of a sudden, what is that saying to you? They see something in me I don't even see in myself. You see? And so, um, so they're, they're just different ways. But it starts with us pressing into God and then being aware of some of these other ways in which he speaks to us. Where do you feel comfortable? Where, where, where do you see fruit? You know? If, if you see fruit in a certain area, it's probably, as an example, let's use evangelist. If everywhere you go, you're preaching, you're teaching, you're winning people to Jesus at, at the coffee shop, at the grocery store, it, it's, it's, it's an indication that that's your gift because that's where you're comfortable and that's where you're seeing fruit. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully that at least... Uh, is a stab at trying to answer that question. I think there's a, yeah. a number of ways. Yeah, I think you've surely done justice to that question. So, and another question here I can see is, how do we identify a true prophet? Somebody on Facebook is asking, how do we identify a true prophet? You know, the prophetic ministry today. So, like you said a while ago, you said in, over there in the United States, now the apostles and the prophets are not being accepted. So the reason behind it is because like the ministry is so polluted, there's a lot of things, a whole lot of things going on. Even here in Africa, there's a lot of things going on. You know, we have a lot of, I don't want to say, uh, like we have a lot of false prophets and mm -hmm. what they do at times is to prophesy just to extort people to gain something from them, maybe material things or you know, just to get something from them, you know. So how do we identify true prophets and prophets I think our people actually need these a lot. Okay, good question. Again, there's a number of answers to that question. Uh, I think I'll start by saying just because somebody says, thus saith the Lord, does not mean the Lord is saying it. Okay. Uh, in fact, while I do not believe that it's wrong to say, thus saith the Lord, I don't really think we have to say it in order for the word to carry power and authority. In other words, I think it carries just as much power and authority for me to say, I'm feeling in my spirit that the Lord's wanting me to share this with you. I think that carries just as much power and authority as thus saith the Lord. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying thus saith the Lord, except by saying that, you're telling everybody they have to listen. It's sort of a, it, it can become a, a power tactic, okay? So that being said, uh, you, you, one of the things you mentioned there was uh, in Africa, there's a lot of people that say they're prophets and they're giving words to get things from people. I think a true prophet makes sure they do not function that way. Uh, let me let me turn it around a little bit um, using another office to make a point with what I'm trying to make here with the prophet. Let's take, for instance, a pastor. Um, a pastor has to be very careful that they do not give hints from the pulpit to their people about what they want or need. A pastor needs to be very careful that they do not, from the pulpit, say, oh, my wife and I are, are wanting to go to the Bahamas for our 25th anniversary, and we're believing God to send us there. That, I mean, it could be done out of ignorance, but that is a veiled request for people to send me to Bahama, to the Bahamas. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So as a pastor, I have to be careful with what I say to my people from the pulpit so that I don't come across as though I'm, I'm trying to get something from them. 
this now let's carry that to the prophet we have to be very careful as a prophet that we refrain from saying things that would be to our benefit because god has not gifted us for us he's gifted us for people here's what you have to understand about the gifts and callings of god the gifts that god has given me are not for me they are for you and the gifts and callings of God that God has given you are not for you. They are for me and others. So we have to be careful that we do not try to benefit from those gifts. I think Joyce Meyer said it very well when she said, she said, your gift can take you where your character can't keep you. And so, so going back to the first, the original question. How can we identify real prophets? I think I have to answer that by turning it upside down. Because many times how people try to determine the difference between a, a true prophet and a false prophet is based on that scripture that says, if the way you want to see if, if a word is true or not is whether it comes to pass. So that many times people will say, well, if a prophet gives me a word and it doesn't come to pass, then they are a false prophet. And that is not necessarily true. And let me try to unpackage that for you. Because I think that that was sort of in the question. How can we tell true prophets and false prophets? So let me, let me talk about how can you discern a false prophet? Just because a word is given and it doesn't come to pass does not necessarily mean that the word was not from God. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, sometimes it's a conditional word. And what I mean by that is, God might give me a word for you, and it goes something like this. I have a plan and a purpose for you. But I'm asking you to do this so that I can open up that plan and purpose in your life. But if you don't do the this, it's not going to come to pass. And you can't blame the prophet for it because you did not fulfill the condition of the, of the word. Here's another way that sometimes prophets miss it, especially people that are maturing in their gift. And I think it's important that we use that term just because a person has a prophetic gift and maybe they're even a prophet. They could be a prophet in training because the gift needs to be matured and developed. And that's why God gives prophets to help prophetic gifts to become mature. And what happens oftentimes when a, a, a prophetic gift is not yet matured in a person they do hear from God the original intent that God wants them to share with somebody. But let me see if I can explain this to where you'll understand it without muddying the waters too much. Oftentimes, what God shares with me to share with you may not make sense to me. So I, but I know it's from God. So I share it with you, and then I try to explain it so that it will make sense to you, because it didn't make sense to me. And in me trying to explain it, I am adding to the word something that was not from God. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? And sometimes when a, a, a prophetic gift is in, is in, 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 in training, because it doesn't make sense to them, they try to help it make sense, and they dilute the word. Let me give you an example of what I want to share uh, of this point, um, and I'll try to make it brief. A number of years, many years ago, we had a family in our church, and, and uh, uh, they, they eventually moved and went to another city, and we hadn't seen them in years, but we knew that they were having marital problems because my wife and I had been trying to help them with their marital problems, but they moved away and uh, be, because they thought some of that was due to uh, him not having a good job and they moved to a bigger city so he'd get a bigger job. Uh, fast forward about six or seven years, one day my wife's praying 
And as she's praying, the, this woman's face comes up in my wife's uh, mind. She's just praying. And, and this woman's face come up in her mind. And my wife didn't know why. But then the Lord spoke to her and said, write her a letter and say, don't do it. That's all God told her. Now, that didn't make sense to my wife. She had no idea what don't do it meant. But we had her address. Back then, you didn't have texts and all that. You just had snail mail. Didn't even have email, you know. And she, she immediately wrote. And she, she said, dear so-and-so, I was in prayer today. And your face come before me. And I felt God told me to write you a letter and say, and she put it in big words, don't do it. And then she said, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it will minister to you or not, but I'm just trying to be obedient to God. And she sent the mail. She gets the le a letter back a couple of weeks later, and the lady tells her that she said, you know, we've had marital problems, and they still haven't gotten much better. I worked for some lawyers, and they saw that I was distraught, so they asked me why, and I confided in them that I was having a problem with my husband. And a couple of weeks ago, they said, if you want to get a divorce, we will do it for you free of charge since you work here. And she said, I'd been contemplating it. And she said that morning, I decided, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I opened your letter. And it said, don't do it. Here's what I want you to understand. If God gives you a word for somebody that doesn't make sense to you, if it's from him, it will make sense to them. You don't have to add to it to make sure it makes sense. And when a, an untested prophet or an un, undeveloped prophet sometimes will do that. And so it makes it look like you can't trust them, that they're false. No, they're just not matured yet. Wow. So I want you to, all I'm trying to say is just because somebody said something that didn't come to pass does not necessarily make them a false prophet. What is a false prophet? Somebody that's trying to get things out of people, somebody that's prophesying for their own benefit, somebody that is 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 uh, um, being used of the enemy to come against the plans and purposes of God. Hmm. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It means when God is telling you something, no matter how foolish it sounds, you don't have to add to it. I think that really helps a lot. Amen. Amen. And another question here I can see that's a bit related to that is that, is there anything like a born prophet and a prophet by impartation? Yeah, you may not understand this prophet by I impartation. I understand. No, I, am, I think I understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, over here, and even I believe even outside there, there are some things uh, that like prophets and apostles and even pastors, they do nowadays. You go to programs and it'll be like, for you to be impacted, you need to come and sow a seed. Like when you sow a seed and they lay hands on you, you will be impacted with that gift. So do you believe in that? And can we really buy the gift of God? And <laughs> so I think that's what the question is, uh, the person is trying to ask. Is there anything like a born prophet, like Jeremiah on five prophet and a prophet by impartation? Okay. There's two questions there. First question. Yeah, two in born, one. Right. Is there a born prophet? Yes. I mean, we'd have to say yes, because of like Jeremiah, before I yeah. knew you, I called hmm. you. So are there people today that were called by God even before they were born to be prophets? Yes. I believe there are. The other side of that coin is, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, I don't believe that most, I'll, I'll put it this way. Most young people are not yet prophets. Even if they were born a prophet, they have a prophetic gift, but it still needs to be mentored. It still needs to be developed before they move from the prophetic function into being a prophet. In, in my opinion, but do I believe that some people are, are anointed prior to even being born? Yes, uh, I, I, I've got in my library a book by a, uh, about a gentleman who an angel appeared at his birth 
uh, in an old shack in Kentucky. And, and an angel appeared there and said God had anointed them to be a prophet. Said that to the, 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 the boy's parents. And these parents weren't even Christians. And, and tr true enough, he, he became a, a well-known prophet, okay, in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s. Okay, so do I believe that there is such thing as a born prophet? Yes. Do I believe in prophet, uh, becoming a prophet through impartation? I think there's really two, que there's two questions to that part. Number one, do I believe that we sow into our future? Yes, I do believe that you and I sow into our future, but we don't sow in order to have hands laid on us. And I got to unpackage that a little bit. I don't believe that we should sell the giving of gifts, the impartation of gifts. In other words, I, I believe it's incorrect for me to say, okay, for those of you that will sow $1,000 into my ministry, I'm going to lay hands on you that God would uh, give you the, such and such a gift. I, I believe that is unbiblical, and I believe it causes division in the body of Christ. And I think it's one reason some pastors don't believe in apostles and prophets today. So, but do I believe in impartation? Yes, I do. I don't believe that I can lay a hand on lay hands on you and impart to you the gift of a prophet. I do believe that if God has called you to be a prophet, I can lay hands on you to release you into that gift. And you see that in Acts chapter 13, I believe it is. Uh, I believe it's Acts 13, 1 and 2, if I'm not mistaken where it says, in the church that was in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, he was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They didn't give them the gift. God had already called them to the gift. They just released them into it. Hallelujah. So I believe in the impartation to that degree. But let me finalize one other point here. Because I said, I do believe we sow into our destiny. How do we sow into our destiny? I'm not going to give to you to lay hands on me. But I am going to give into ministries so that I'm sowing into the ministry so that mine can become a reality. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of sense. A lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And another controversial one here, I think uh, it's coming from someone in the United States. She's asking, can a woman be an apostle? Okay. Uh, yes, a woman can be an apostle. Uh, there is a woman apostle, at least one woman apostle uh, described in scripture. Um, I, don't, I, I don't remember the exact location, but I can tell you the name. It's Junia, J-U-N-I-A. And it talks about Junia being an apostle. And if you uh, research that uh, through his, history, historical uh, references to the theology circles. Some, of course, are not going to say it, but you will find a lot of theologians who testify to the fact that that, that was a female apostle. So uh, I, think, I think the Lord put that in scripture, even though it just shows one to give us the understanding that, um, that yes, a woman can be an apostle. Uh, women's can be women can be prophets. Deborah was a prophet. Okay, Peter's was it Peter's daughters? I, or I forget whose daughters. That wasn't Peter's daughters, but it talked about uh, uh, three three daughters in Scripture were 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 prophets. So um, uh, yes, you know. Well, powerful, and 
I'm trying to see another one here. Can someone be called into two different offices, like being an apostle and also a teacher or a pastor or whatever? Okay, good question. And the answer to that also is yes. Uh, in fact, most apostles are called into more than one of the FIFO gifts. Uh, most of, uh, a lot of apostles are apostles, prophets, evangelists. Uh, they're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. Why? Because if they are a Pauline apostle, which is an apostle focused like Paul functioned, he would go into areas all by himself or take one other person, and he had to be all of those things to get the church off the ground. So many apostles carry all five office gifts or at least three or four of them. But other office gifts can also, a lot of times you'll find a person that is a great pastor, but they're also a great teacher. They carry both gifts. Sometimes you will find a person that is a pastor and, and, and an evangelist. They have both, uh, off, they, they function in both offices. So yes, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's often the case. Wow. Another one that's like that is, can one ask the spiritual gift and not be called as a minister? Can one have these spiritual gifts and not be called? Yeah, as I call, the spiritual gift according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 there. So, and not being called as a five-foot minister. Uh, I'm going to answer that in two ways. I do that a lot, don't I? Um, uh, the first one is, can a person be a five-fold office gift and not be in full-time ministry? And the answer to that is yes. I believe that there are people sitting in our congregations. Uh, maybe we're saying, oh, I wish I had all five operating in my church. And I believe there are people sitting in your congregations that may be a five-fold office gift, but they're not in full-time ministry. But as, let's use profit again as an example. Uh, sometimes you might have a person sitting in your congregation that even though they would not call themselves a prophet, they operate prophetically and they are a fivefold prophet. Now, here's why. Because I believe, I believe, uh, uh, I, I'm going to share something with you that some of you may have never heard before. I believe that to be a fivefold office gift, apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and teacher, you have to not only be able to function prophetically, let me use prophet as an example. I think to be a, a five-fold office gift, a prophet, uh, you do not only function prophetically, but you can also see the prophetic gift in other people, mentor and develop that gift in other people, and release them. I think the same thing is true for pastors. I think a fivefold pastor is not only somebody who can function as a pastor, but can also see that gift in others, mentor and develop that gift in others, and release others into pastoral ministry. Therefore, I do not believe that every pastor, I'm talking about God called, God anointed, effective pastors of a local congregation. I do not believe that all of those are fivefold pastors. Because some of those are can function effectively with their congregation, but they don't have the gift to see that gift in others, mentor and develop it, and release others into a pastoral ministry. And so I believe it's possible for a person to be an effective pastor and not be a five-fold pastor. For that reason, I believe that not all pastors, not all people function prophetically, or not all teachers are five-fold office gifts. That being, so let's bring it back to the original question. Can a person be sitting in the congregation and be a five-fold prophet? Yes. Why? Because they're mentoring and developing other prophets. Yeah, wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful. So talking about the apostles, pastors, prophets, evangelists, which one is the most important? There's a question here. Say, who is the most important among the five-fold ministers? Is there any important one or they all complement each other? Okay, so let me answer the question. Which is the most important? Yes, that's the answer. 
In other words, I don't think there's a hierarchy. If there is a hierarchy, it would only be because of the fact that the that the uh, uh, apostle is a pastor to pastors. Okay, an apostle is a pastor to pastors. So if there is any hierarchy, it would probably be that the apostle um, um, is more of a covering gift than some of the others. But I do not believe that the Lord elevates one above the other. I think the most important gift is the one needed at the time. And let's 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 use let's use the example of could a person have all five office function in all five? Yeah, many apostles do. Many apostles function in all five. So if they function in all five gifts, which gift that they function in is the most important? The one that's needed at the time. Powerful, powerful. And there's a question, I think it's like a follow-up question based on what you said earlier. He said, as a pastor, how should we ask? He says, it's wrong for a minister to stand on the pulpit and ask the congregation for help, like personal needs. So uh, according to Apostle Paul, he said, when we take care of your spiritual needs, you should be able to take care of our material needs. So as a pastor, what is the right way to ask your congregation for things? Okay. Um... I don't have time to go into it because we've only got 10 minutes left. I mean, as far as reading scripture and everything, uh, I, I, but I could read to you scripture, especially from uh, the pastoral epistles, where, where the apostle Paul says, uh, quoting the Old Testament, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, uh, that, a, a, a person, uh, that a person is worthy of their hire. Uh, in fact, there's another, there's a scripture that says, uh, that the the the, uh, uh, the that the one who feeds you the word of God is worthy of double honor, and when you check out that word honor, it really means financial provision. So in reality, the person who feeds you is worthy of double what they're getting. Okay, uh, according to Scripture, I used to joke with my congregation and says, "You can't pay me what I'm worth." Okay, but I was just joking with them, of course. So how should the pastor uh, go about sharing their needs? Well, first of all, we don't share our needs. We share the people's responsibility. We share God's way of provision. And so uh, I, I would, uh, uh, one of the things I did is, as a pastor, is I was very uh, straightforward with the congregation on financial issues because I think that money, uh, people get stuck when it comes to money. And my job as a pastor was to help get them unstuck. And so uh, every time I took an offering, every Sunday when we took the offering, I spent anywhere from two minutes to 10 minutes before the offering with a mini sermon or testimony or something on giving and on as you get into God's economy, you give into God's economy, God will get into your economy because that's the way God set it up. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. We don't give to get, but when we give, we get. Okay, that's the way God set it up. And so then I would be very open with them in some of periodically in some of those teachings before an offering about the church's responsibility to care for those who, who feed them. And I was very careful and, and, and I made sure that I did not have an ulterior motive. And I was very careful to let them know, I'm not telling you this because I want to get from you. I'm telling you this because I want you to be obedient to God and his word. I'm trying to grow you as people because you are not my source. I would tell them, you are not my source. This church is not my source. I live by the same principles I teach you. My giving and my sowing into the kingdom of God causes God to be my source. And when whether you give or not, God is going to take care of me. I'm sharing with you for your own benefit. And I was very upfront with that. And so, uh, uh, so I, I, uh, the point I'm making here is 
I made sure that my sharing with them in regard to them giving to the church and giving to the pastor was not, it was not motivated out of my need, but motivated out of their need to get involved in the economy of God. And I always had to check my heart along those lines. And, um, and I hope that answers the question, you know. Yeah, yeah, I believe you've done a lot of I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Amen. There we can. Now I can. Amen. Uh, so there's this question I would like to ask. Like it's coming from I myself. And the question is that I'm really interested on how to, should I say, how to run a church where the five foot uh, offices will be effective. So how do we operate a ministry where pastors will be able to operate as pastors? And under me, I will have apostles, or maybe I'll, have, I'll be able to train prophets, I'll be able to have evangelists. And I mean, in the same church, we rarely see that today. Right. So, but I'm really interested in this. So how do, how do, we, how do we come up, or how do we build a ministry such as that? Okay. Uh let me answer it by saying, first of all, because you go to uh, uh, the school that I teach in, uh, th there is a five, we have an introductory class on fivefold ministry. And then in the graduate class, we, I, I, I developed a, 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 a fivefold class in the graduate uh, school of the, of the school. Um, and then now we're developing another class in the undergrad that will answer your question. Now, I'm not putting it off. I'm going to talk about it for a minute. But I want you to know that there is another class in the undergrad that's going to uh, address that. Uh, but I addressed it in the graduate class as well. And here's the concept. Uh, and here's the premise of that class. While many of you, I said, might still be in churches or denominations that is still struggling as to whether apostles and prophets are valid for today. Many of you have gotten past that, and even your church has gotten past that, and you're in churches, maybe even denominations that are saying, okay, we do believe that there is a need for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The next question is, how do we see them operate in the church? And that's what that graduate class dealt with. And that's also what some of the new undergrad class is going to deal with. And here's the terminology I used, which might help to explain it. What we need to do is figure out how to implement complementary five-fold ministry in the local church. And I, I, I chose those words carefully to implement complementary fivefold ministry in the church. And the best way I think I can answer that in just the couple minutes we have left to help you understand where we go in that class and, and, we'll, and we'll give you a little bit of a help right here, is I use the analogy of a marriage. When a man and woman stand before that pastor to become one, and he says, I now pronounce you man and wife. It would be nice if at that moment you became one. <laughs> but that's just the beginning of the process. You're not one by any way, shape, or form. Why? Because you both bring your dysfunction of your baggage from your past into that relationship. And you're both trying to change one another. And if you're not careful, you're competing with each other. And in order for that marriage to be healthy and strong and developed, you have to move from competing with each other to complementing one another. And that analogy, I believe, is very viable for the question you just asked. The problem that we see oftentimes in churches now that are embracing fivefold ministry are seeing competition oftentimes rather than complementary ministry. 
And so we have to learn how to work together and function together in order for the body to be developed and become all God wants it to become. And so that just is introducing where we go in those courses. But I think it at least gives a little bit of an answer to you uh, as to, because I think your, your idea was, if we're not careful, we're all going to be vying for position, and, and that's the problem. And we have to get over it. And how do we get over it? Remember I said, the person is the gift. Get over yourself. Yeah. You are not everything that church needs. As a, as a pastor, you are not everything that church needs. If you were everything that church needed, the, 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 the concept that most of our churches have now as the pastor being everything, the church would be fulfilled, and it's not. Wow. So we need to get over ourselves. And we also even need to get over the fact that, of thinking that our gift is the one they need. Our mm -hmm. gift is one of the five they need. Amen. Our gift is just one of the five that is needed in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And we need to remind ourselves just before we go today, he said the title is not as important as the function. It's not you being called an evangelist or an apostle that is very important, but what you do for God, what you do in the body of Christ, and what you do wherever you find yourself. God bless you so, so much, Dr. Richard Cook. Ah, and I really respect 53 years in ministry, 51 years in marriage. Wow. I believe the Lord has really blessed you with a whole lot of wisdom and for you to have been able to maintain it all through these years and, and, and you're still there strong for the Lord. Hallelujah. And I really bless the name of the Lord for your life. And even today you spend your life impacting the next generation for those who are connected on Zoom and those watching on Facebook or those that will be watching later on YouTube. Dr. Richard Cook is actually one of our professors at the School of Urban Missions at Dorado. And if you are interested, you know, we are actually admitting students right now. Let me use this opportunity to tell you that I am a product of SUM. I'll be graduating next year by the special grace of God. And I've been blessed through this institution. And if you really want to know more about SUM, you can contact me or contact Richard Cook, by Dr. Richard Cook on Facebook. And we have our official page, School of Urban Missions is on Facebook too. You can just research about this school. You know, I believe the Lord is going to bless you a lot. To everyone who has made it, the Lord blesses you so much. This is through transformations. And I am Pastor Bello Elias. God bless you. Mr. Dixon, God bless you. God bless you. iPhone, iPhone, I don't know a lot of names there. And on Facebook, God bless you. Taipani, God bless you. Nico Akon, Apostle, Pastor Mandy, Anna. A lot of people down there on Facebook. God bless you so much. And a lot of SUM students, too, I see them on Facebook. They are saying, I, uh, doctor, they are saying hello. God bless you so much. And before we go, I want us to say a very short prayer for... Our daddy here, I pray that the Lord himself continue to strengthen you. I pray that may he continue to perfect everything concerning your heart. I pray that may the Lord continue to increase you. Even as you are pouring into the new generation, the next generation, I say may he himself continue to fill you even more and more. And I pray for strength. I pray for strength. I say may you continue to prosper in earth. In the name of Jesus, I pray for your wife. I pray for your family. I pray for your children and your, your grandchildren. I pray for God's hand to be upon them continually. And this legacy, this legacy that you are living, I say may they be able to carry it on even unto the next generation to come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we bless your name, O Lord. We bless your name, O Lord. And even as you have used your son to be a blessing to us, I pray, dear Lord, that you continue to strengthen him continue to anoint him, grant him more entrances, and use him more and more. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And before we round up, I feel like you should say a word of prayer for everyone that is connected, and if, most especially young ministers, because most people I see connected on Facebook are ministers. So I feel like you pray for everyone connected and young ministers worldwide. Sure. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray right now for these men and women, their spouses, uh, their families, 
that the blessing of God would rest upon them. Amen. I pray in the name of Jesus that wisdom, revelation, understanding, blessing, goodness, faith, mercy, and righteousness would be poured out upon them. That, Lord, you would speak in them and through them. And even in the silent uh, seasons of their sleep tonight, that you would speak Amen. to them and give Amen. them direction and give them understanding. Lord, I pray your anointing, your blessing, your goodness to rest upon them all in the name of the Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's share the grace together before we go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely, His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you.